We can be inside, we can be outside, we've got a TV outside and the sound's outside as well. And we'd like you all to be uh, comfortable, figure out where you'd like to sit. And then we're going to run a little 10 minute clip of John and have about six, seven speakers. Time for the Mouseketeers to roll call. Oh, well, okay, Mouseket partners. Count off now. John! Now, who's going to bring in the next talent today? Uh, me! Well, who do you think you are? Wait a minute, wait a minute, Mouseketeers. Johnny, tell us, what talent did you bring in today? Well, Jimmy, I thought the Mouseketeers would like to meet my brother, Bobby, who's the second best fencer in the world. Oh, yeah, great. Hi, Bobby. Come right in. Nice to have you with us. But uh, what's this about your being the second best fencer? That's because I'm the best. Oh, oh. no, you're not. I can right. do anything. Who are you? Touche to you both, Bobby and Johnny. That was really something, boy. Wonderful. I hear pronounce the match a draw. Yeah! He, 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 just, he just loves... You and, and having plucked you, I guess, from the Mickey Mouse Club, right? Well, no. I was, I was on, the, on the skit after they dropped my option at Disney. And uh, I uh, well, you know, started drinking and... He was 11 years old, I think. <laughs> no, I, I freelanced and... and uh, and I went on interviews, and I, and I wanted to do westerns more than anything else, and they would always ask me if I knew how to ride, and so, uh, you know, I, you lied about anything they asked you. You're supposed to be in school. Well, I stopped by Hattie's at lunchtime to get the mail. This came for you. I was very impressed with him in a film called The Big Country, which came out in 1958. And I thought, I went to see that just before we started shooting The Rifleman, knowing that he was going to play my father. And I thought, I can't believe they're casting this awful, mean uh, guy as my pa. It's got to be the money. Yeah, so you're playing hooky? Well, i never seen $500 before. Yeah, you're not going to see it now either. Back to school, boy. Oh, but Paul. Did you ever use, not during the, the production, but just off camera, uh, the rifle? Did you ever experiment and play with it? Only if I was real angry at somebody. But um, no. I wasn't really into guns that much. I, I, um, I was into baseball, and we, when we started doing the series, I would bring a baseball bat and my glove and, and a ball uh, and try to get a game going during lunch. Um, but it was... Uh, he always insisted on being the first one up at bat, and, and uh, we couldn't find the ball afterwards, so uh, I got tired of that. You did get an Emmy nomination for Best Supporting Actor in a Series, which is pretty amazing. I mean, you, were, you guys had such a dynamic relationship in the series. Chuck didn't talk to me for half a season. <laughs> I, I loved the Wranglers, and, and I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to, you know, um, be a real cowboy. I wanted to be convincing, and, 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 and then one day, one of them, Buster Tro, he was doing a butterfly with a, a little cotton rope, and I was, you know, how do you do that? And then, uh, actually, uh, Monty Montana was on the show, and he gave me a rope, taught me how to do a flat spin. Cowpoke went riding out one dark and windy day. Upon a ridge he rested as he went along his way. When all at once a mighty herd of red-eyed cows he saw plowing through the ragged skies and a cloudy draw. Yippee I hey. Sky. 
And you were working with Howard Hawks on El Dorado. Howard Hawks. What was Hawks like? Did he uh, have any rehearsal time for you? Uh, I suggested that he put a, 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 a line on me when I got shot and, so I could, you know, um, fall really hard. And he, was, he wasn't interested in hearing my suggestions. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he had enough on his mind. You know? So I said, okay. And, and I could be the only uh, male that Wayne ever... Uh, caressed as uh, I was dying. I mean, I'm in his arms. That's that's the way to say. After about the third time, he said, "I'm sorry, Johnny. I'll get it this time. I'll get it this time." And then, uh, and I was thinking, you know, hey, you're John Wayne. You don't have to apologize to me. You know, <laughs> you know I was amazed. You know, I was really. I mean, he was very humble. You know, uh, I'm sitting there and. And he's remember, remembering his line. He says, no, I want to do it again. And he said, okay, I'll get it this time, Johnny. But, Johnny, don't smile. <laughs> be my little baby bumblebee. Hey, Shona, you talking to me? Bring home all the honey love to me. Well, can you cook a meal for three? Honey, keep a passing, please. I got the words wrong, yes, I did. But I want you to be my baby. You threw away my lines. <laughs> it's time to scat. Honey, keep a buzzing, please. I've got a dozen cousin bees, but I want you to be my baby bumblebee. Buzz, buzz. Johnny came out, and he was so great to work with. I mean, he still rides a horse like he's like 18 years old. And he's still doing his lasso tricks like no other. Thank you, Mr. Salem. You know I love the art of making pictures. This wonderful fundraiser and this big event, and they're just showing our film, Bill Tillman and the Outlaws. So um, we're all happy to be here, you know, to support Johnny. I cannot tell you how touched I have been putting this together and seeing the love that has come out for you, Johnny, people that not only are here that have traveled far distances and, and come but people that couldn't be here and still wanted to support this evening thank you for coming johnny we love you buddy thank you for being with us. your cards and letters and your messages on facebook are a great uplift for him his wife charlotte his family friends and fans this is bobby crawford celebrating the talent of my brother Johnny with you.
Bobby, thank you so much for putting that together. You talk about versatility. Can we have one more time for <laughs> all the great different things that Johnny did? Now, you saw an actor, uh, a cowboy, riding, roping, bull riding. But you also saw songwriting. You saw singing. And he was a big band leader. So for many years, his pianist, the person that was there, as Johnny thrilled and entertained many thousands of people, I'm bringing up Peter Minton. Peter, come on up. Gosh, hey, anybody here remember Johnny swearing? That's why I said, gosh. Uh, what well, is really an honor to be here, and so great to hear Johnny sing again, even if it's on screen. I speak on behalf of the baby boomer boys and the little girls who idolized Johnny on television in the 1950s and 60s. As kids, of course, we all looked up to movie and TV stars, but especially if they were close to our age, right? I could admire young Johnny on so many levels, one being his incredible acting, and another being his natural, just handsomeness. And I thought back then, oh, if I only could have reached out and befriended this handsome, talented kid. I never thought it would happen, but it did, many years later. In the 80s, I was visiting New York and listening to Vince Giordano's Nighthawks. And to my surprise, there was, in a tuxedo, Johnny Crawford, singing dreamily like Bing Crosby. Johnny had succeeded in emulating the vivacity and tune of the tuneful 1920s and 30s, my favorite music. So from then on, we became pen pals and then soulmates, eventually performing together professionally in Hollywood as well as my hometown, San Francisco. And musically, we had an intuitive understanding. It just needed no explaining between us. Johnny was completely flexible and comfortable improvising ballads and rhythm numbers with equal ease. Now, having already established himself as an actor and a teen idol, he now, when I met him, was recruiting like-minded musicians to form his orchestra. And he, he was able to use his bronco-busting TV uh, persona to draw attention to the music that he found the most thrilling. At this stage in his career, Johnny happily accepted the position of Grand Marshal at the Rodeo or the Parade. And then he'd come home, and he directed his attention to the, what's called the Great American Songbook, reviving old melodies and styles for a younger generation uh, that revered the styles of the past. So while I was working with Johnny as his piano player, he was invited to be a special guest on the Vicki Lawrence show called The Vicki Show. Vicki told Johnny he had been her greatest teenage heartthrob, surpassing Ed Cookie Burns, <laughs> Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., Marty Milner, George Meharis, all of whom would be on this television program of Vicky's, but Johnny, who had, by the 90s, had kind of grown indifferent to interviews. He'd done so many, after all. He was an old timer in Hollywood by that time. So he agreed to be her guest with a condition that he demonstrate his current act on national television. And so uh, on the program, after she adored Johnny in the interview chair for a while, she asked him to sing, which he did. He even tap danced a little bit, wore a straw hat, national television. So Johnny would have enjoyed being an actor in television series again. And one of his fantasies, I think this is so great, 
he told me he had a fantasy of there being a sitcom of a, a middle-aged guy, a singer, trying to promote a 1920s dance orchestra in the impenetrable climate of rock and rap. It would be based on Johnny's own hilarious and sometimes chaotic life as a band leader. But the highlight of his uh, of this proposed sitcom was would be, of course, to feature him in a great song at the end. So Charlotte will tell you Johnny was a dreamer, trying to replace discord with harmony everyone, everywhere he went. And in a perfect world, Johnny Crawford would be more famous than Dick Clark or Harry Nilsson. And if there is a heaven, Johnny is there trading songs with Al Jolson, Russ Colombo, Bing Crosby, Al Boley, Smith Ballou, and of course, Maurice Chevalier sweeping the clouds away. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Where's Darby Hinton? <laughs> Actor, longtime friend of Johnny's. Come on for Darby Hinton. Hi. Um, well, it's great to see a lot of you here. I know Johnny would have appreciated it. Um, you know, I got to say, uh, in 2010, I went to my sister's godmother, Jane Russell, because she'd been with us at Fess's Vineyard up there doing the sing-alongs and we all had. And, you know, I invited her to uh, Fess's service. And she just looked at me and said, you know, Darb, I just don't do funerals anymore. And I didn't understand it at the time, but recently I've been understanding it. And I have been skipping a lot of these because uh, we've been losing too many recently. I know uh, Will Smith, I'll take our hat off for him for a second. He just left us. Um, so I don't come out to a lot of these. But for the love of Charlotte, Johnny, Bobby, his whole family, for a lot of you that I know flew in, drove in, and, and you know, even during these crazy times, came to uh, pay homage to him. So I don't have to sit there and tell you of all his you know, great achievements and his awards. And it was really kind of hard to me to even think of, you know, what do you say about a guy that looks great in white tails and a hat, and then the next minute he's jumping off a horse onto a bull? Um, it's great. And you know, one of the other reasons was I've done a lot of things for kid actors. I've done a lot of different organizations. And before I forget, let me say the patron saint to all of us child actors, Paul Peterson. Um, thank you. And Bobby knows everybody. I mean, he really is what he's done. And, and um, I've been you know, fortunate to work with him and SAG After Young Performance Committee looking at it. Anyway, all these things for kid actors. So I kind of know a lot about him, being one myself, too. And unfortunately, there's some that have given us kind of a bad name. But that, that sure wasn't Johnny. Um, I didn't get to know him when I was younger, even though we were both born in L.A., even though we were both on television, probably, you know, while still in diapers. And it wasn't until later uh, when we'd go to conventions and stuff. And I remember, I think, uh, the Hopalong Festival was the first one with the rope and stuff. Okay, how many people have been hit in the head by Johnny's rope? Can I see a hands there? Come on. You know it. If you hung around Johnny long enough, you were getting hit in the head by that rope. Um, but you know, it wasn't until we, we did a Malabar event. Uh, he, Haggerty, Dan Haggerty, and myself, and it was just the three of us. And uh, I don't want to spread any rumors or, but Haggerty can and be a little jokester and uh, um, anyway. Uh, and we all did an interview together. And the guy they sent up from the local television station was obviously very well versed and did a lot of his homework because as soon as the cameras rolled and they started doing the interviews, he looked at me and said, so how was it working with Chuck Connors? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, it was great, you know, and I loved that rifle and it was all, and Johnny, as you can see with his humor, was great. He picked it right up. Oh, yes, you know, and Fess Parker, he was so tall. And, 
And we did it till we had Dan Haggerty peeing in his pants, I gotta tell you. So, uh, you know, that's when I really got to know Johnny and bond with Johnny. Um, you know, we were only born a few years apart, like I say, he had a television father for five years in Chuck Connors. I had a television father for six years in Fess Parker. Um, you know, we grew up, we, we did a lot of the same things, and for him to come out the other end, uh, as the gentleman he was, as the caring about his fans and his friends, um, that's what couldn't keep me away from uh, coming and, and saying a few words for him. And uh, like I said, Paul, I wanted to make sure because he felt really bad, but you know, he's got a few of his own challenges, but he helped set up the GoFundMe and everything. And just so many, I got a lot of texts from people that wanted to do. Um, just like the, the promo that we did. All right, one last, one last thing about Johnny, because I love it. We knew we wanted him in Bill Tillman and the Outlaws. And we knew what kind of state of mind he was unfortunately falling into. So we actually shot his scene a year before we did any of the other principal shooting. And I had him fly out, the director picked him up on the airport, and then on the way back to his house, the director was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I have to rewrite everything. He's not gonna be able to say these lines. He's just not going to, because Johnny unfortunately at the time was kind of taken over by this. And uh, showed up the next day on the set and they threw Johnny up on the horse. And once he got on that horse, he started riding it around. The rope came out and he was the Johnny Crawford and he was saying his line. And he was supposed to actually ride in, get off the horse and give his speech. And the director went, no, no, stay on the horse. <laughs> it's great. And, and just to tell you, you talked about his smile that he always had. And I know in the last, you know, the times I got to spend with him at the very end, he might have not known who I was, but he sure still had that smile. And he was still in that, that great thing. But anyway, and the final thing was, and it was not written in the script, but when he took off on the horse, all the kids followed him, all the extras and stuff, because he just had that magnetism about him. So it's, it's great. I love that we got to do that. I love that he got to see it and the people that showed up at the wonderful McRae Ranch that got to see that, uh, that showing. And I'm going to stop rambling on because there's too many stories to tell them. But just Johnny, love you. You're a role model. You've meant so much to so many people. I think there's one or two ladies out here where you might have been their first crush. Just guessing. Um, but I, I thank you for uh, asking me to come up and say some things, and I certainly thank you with everything that's going on that you came out also to say goodbye and, and celebrate. And that's one thing that did get me out of here, Charlotte, is that it is a celebration of his wonderful life. Thank you. That was beautiful, Darby. Thank you for sharing those stories. We saw him earlier fencing. Bobby, how old were you in? in uh, I think I'm 11 John was nine. You were 11 and Johnny was nine. I was 12. <laughs> okay, or 12, but I don't know. All right. Come on up and share some more. His older brother, Bobby. Well, I've been uh, sleeping and dreaming since John made his last trip here on what to say. So bear with me because I can't write it down. And I always find it hard to speak uh, when I truly feel emotional about it. But um, got to be Johnny's buddy for 75 years. And uh, we started out on South Tremaine and Central Wilshire District that is now a historical district of old neo-Victorian triplexes and neo-Spanish uh, uh, style homes and had a great time in that neighborhood because it was populated by families like ours with multiple children and uh, 
the neighborhood was a lively one and we would uh, challenge each other to climb up the light pole and uh, chase each other around the neighborhoods. And I just had a wonderful wrestling buddy from the day he came in at uh, birth for the next uh, 10 years that we were, or nine years that we were in this triplex. And we had a kind of Irish twins. We were a year and 10 months apart. I always felt they were about the same size and only realized in hindsight that I was a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. And I guess I exerted that, but he never took offense. He was always game for whatever we wanted to do. And uh, that was just a thrilling childhood. And because we would be bouncing off the bed and the floor and the walls on Sunday, uh, my grandma knew we needed to get us out of the house. Uh, we ended up going to the Sunday school down the street. The neighborhood was safe enough. We could walk six blocks to the church and past the grammar school we go to at Wilshire Crest and go to the Christian Science School. And our school teacher it just happened to be one of the top kid talent agents in the industry, Jean Halliburton and her partner, Dorothy Macklin. And uh, the thing that they thrilled us most with, me in particular, was uh, I can is the son of I am, that God loves us, and that you can do whatever you put your mind to do it, but you do it with love and compassion. And I just carry that. And I think it influenced John as well. We didn't talk religion particularly through our lives, but I think we had an absolute faith that it was all good here and the great thereafter. Uh, and so we have had along our 75 years, many loved ones take that journey. And I forever feel they are so much freer than we are. And that day will come for us all. But I think that release, and when I was with John in these last months, so blessed that he got out of the nursing home and we had six weeks in contact and in touch and rubbing his toes and taking him on a wheelchair ride around the town. And one of our last rides was in the wheelchair down the street. And there's this beautiful husky that comes to the gate and rubs his nose. Well, there are so many steps along the way that I wanted to say all the gifts and marvelous moments I've had with John. With the Mickey Mouse Club, and following that, being able to go to the Emmys and sit in front of Fred Astaire and be among the stars that we worship, to get to the shows in Hollywood and go see Buster Keaton do his vaudeville act and then go backstage and meet Buster Keaton. Uh, it was just surreal in so many ways and very real that we got to be Hollywood cowboys. We moved from Mid Wilshire to the Hollywood Hills and became Hollywood hillbillies. And there was still a lot of open space up there around Lake Hollywood. And we'd go up and play with the rattlesnakes, never saw one. Uh, but the coyotes were impressive. And uh, the howling in the night. But I just felt we were in our old west. And uh, we would play shooting games around there. And we'd build forts with the neighborhood kids. And the kids down in the dell would attack us up on the hill. And likewise. Um, but I'm, I guess, expressing the fact that we had uh, an American Flyer train set that hung from the ceiling in the garage and we would bring down and create our crashes and uh, that we built soapbox derbies. Uh, we led an abnormal, normal life. And we could play wiffle ball and bat the ball up against the hill and fast speed pitch at each other and play touch football on every holiday with the neighborhood kids and then get to go to work, uh, and it was really get to go to play. I was very fortunate that I was not sure what I would ever be, but I knew I needed to get through school and I really wanted to get to college, and so I really worked at my academics, and th that wasn't easy for me. Uh, and everything John did seemed very easy. Just his handwriting always impressed me. But w what I was really startled about in retrospect, in these last couple of years, was there was a moment in time when I got to go around doing home movies of the band. He would never release that. He, if, he wouldn't have anybody else look at it. I didn't look at it for years. 
But as I'm going through his collection here, we put together a DVD of a number of times he performed, and it's decent enough that you really get the impression of what he did as a band leader, let alone as a rodeo cowboy. And uh, what I didn't realize, because I had a fair voice as a kid, but I sort of never changed as I got in the middle. I stopped singing. I stopped even thinking about the lyrics of songs. But in the last couple of years, listening to him do his songs, listening to those lyrics, never fully appreciating the magic of those, that era and the emotions it could evoke in us all, um, really impressed me that my brother had a true amazing talent of doing a lyric as simply and straightforwardly, but filled with emotion and hold the sound of that word in a way that made you listen, but also just touched your soul. So that's what they're going to play here in a little bit. There's one YouTube that was captured in nice time, but that he sings what's called Home or When Shadows Fall has a magnificent poetic lyric. And uh, to be short about it, one song I learned early as I was filming him that I had never heard sung as he sang it and watched the crowd dance to it romantically was with a smile and a song. With a smile and a song, life is like a bright sunny day. Your cares fade away and your heart is young. With a smile and a song, all the world seems to awaken anew, rejoicing with you while the song is sung. There's no use in grumbling when raindrops come tumbling. You're the one who can fill the world with sunshine. With a smile and a song, life flows along with a smile and a song. Oh, all the world is in tune and life flows along with a smile and a song. <laughs> anyway, that's what I thought I'd leave you with. John will be singing. Evening marks the close of day. Skies of blue begin to gray. Evening hues are fading in the west Evening ever brings to me dreams of days that used to be memories of those I love the best When shadows fall and trees Whisper day is ending My heart is ever wending home When crickets call My heart is forever yearning Once more to be returned the hills conceal the setting sun stars begin a peeping one by one night covers all and though fortune may forsake me Sweet dreams will ever take me home. You know, one of the great things about media is it captures moments forever. And if it's something that touches the heart, it really lives on longer than we live. It goes way beyond us and our journey here on this earth. I'm looking at this poster here and I see Lucas McCain, Mark McCain, and I think of the little boy that always said Paul <laughs> in that cute way. I would watch that show every week, never knowing that I would meet that precious little boy and we'd be friends for a long, long time. We don't have to say that there was a great 
love in the Crawford family. It's self-evident from uh, the way they've treated each other throughout the years and even the sentiments that they are sharing this afternoon. Bobby, thank you for those precious stories and memories. And we'd like to bring up one of the nieces. So, Kathy, would you come up, please? I'm sorry, Patty, would you come up? They're doing a setup, and if you just oh, introduce Excellent, them. hi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Patty. I'm his eldest niece, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not ready to say goodbye either. But I've known this guy, and this guy right here, f from the moment I was born, they were there. That being said, that's a whole history that I'm just gonna have to leave to your imagination. <laughs> but I, what I wanted to come up here and say mainly was thank you. Some very special thank yous to Charlotte. I love this lady. She stood by him for <laughs> Darby, his last film, what a joy. What a treasure you gave us. Thank you so much. Uh, and of course to Paul Peterson, who couldn't be here today, is that right? Um, I didn't have a chance to ask. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Paul Peterson um, for the GoFundMe campaign. You all have been a godsend in our lives. Whether you knew who we were or not, we knew who you were. We, knew, we know who you are. And let me just say this the fans, to all of you people out there who showed up at his signings and his convention appearances, I have n let, me, let me just insert. I love, I have a fandom too. It's Star Trek, Star Wars. We know about those people. Okay. <laughs> I have, n at every single appearance that I was with Johnny, I never saw a more genteel compassionate, respectful group of people than you guys. And I, for one, am so very grateful to all of you. And if I've missed anybody, which is probably just everybody, I hope not. Thank you so much. And okay, we can take that down now. <laughs> but I brought my mom. Are you still there? Okay, I'm gonna put her on speaker. I want to I remember about Johnny because he was my baby brother. Uh, it started very early in my life. When I was about five years old, he appeared in the living room one day in a bassinet. And um, my main memories about us growing up in the original house that we lived in uh, was he and Bobby and I running around doing crazy stuff. You know, just being kids and playing Roy Rogers and Dale Levins and of course, I grew very tall, and the girl was the eleventh. And um, I think the thing I really want to do is to share a little bit of who he was as a kid, other than being just an imp who ran around doing crazy kid things. Johnny was the strongest kid I think I've ever known. And he carried his stubbornness and his kindness to his life. I don't know how many of you know the story of how he became an actor. But he was an actor before he ever found an agent. Uh, when he was a very young child, he was put in a high chair and was the little boy in uh, a play called Mr. Belvedere. When we were all old enough, because Columbia Studios hired the families of the people who worked there as extras, we were put into the movies. I was first, I was six years old. And then Bobby got sick one day, and they needed a little boy to be a refugee for a movie with Loretta Young. And Bobby got very ill. Well, Johnny was a go-head, and Bobby wasn't. So 
mother took a whole bunch of black shoe polish and she turned Johnny into Bobby. <laughs> and Johnny went to be in this movie, his first job on film. And the scene was when Reddy Young was at this orphanage and she's handing candy bars out to the children. And so they did it. No, oh, he was wonderful as the starving child who wanted the candy bars. Somebody yelled, cut. And the assistant came around to pick up the candy bar so they could do it again, and Johnny wouldn't let go of his. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the first stories. His persistence in what he felt he needed to do was remarkable. And when I was about seven or eight, I was taken to the big pool at LA High to learn to swim, and the boys were taken in turn as they got a little older and were capable of going to swimming class, Johnny was terrified of water. Absolutely terrified of the water. And he, he was told, you have to get your face in the water in order to swim. And uh, he literally, I saw him doing it when he went into the bathtub at night, he would push his face in the water and hold his breath as long as he could. And he did this for several weeks until finally he, he, he had lost his fear of water and he became a fine swimmer. We, were, we went to Sunday school. The parents stayed in bed, took Sundays off while we walked it right our by Sunday school over time. And um, there was never any thought of there being a career per se. We were just doing what we did, you know, and being extras in the movies. And one day, uh, a Sunday school teacher was driving home. She was leaving the parking parking lot. She happened to be an actor's agent. Johnny, she stopped for a little boy on a bike, and it was Johnny. And he waved his thing, ah, thank you so much, and rode past her. And she, what a cute kid. I'm gonna find out, who's that kid? She, she inquired of her fellow teachers at the church and found out that his brother was in her, in her class, Bobby was one of her students. And that's how Gene Halliburton became our agent. John's difficulty as a child, the hardest one for him, was the fact that he, we in those days we didn't call it dyslexic, but he had a problem learning to understand and read letters. And my grandma, who was kind of the rock of the family, decided that it was time for trying to do what she could to help. So she went out and got a bunch of flashcards. And every day she would drill Johnny on these cards. And uh, one day I happened to be in the back when he left and I heard my grandmother cry. I had never heard my grandmother cry before. And I walked in, I said, Grandma, what's the matter? She said, I don't think he's ever going to learn to read. I can't get him to see it. Well, by the time he was nine years old, he could read his own scripts. <laughs> and his first major job was playing with a little boy with a French accent that was on Lux TV theater. It was called Little Boy Lost, and it was the video version of the film with Big Crosby, and he played the orphan child with that accent. My mother coached him, did the actor. And the one thing that most people don't realize about John, I think, is the thing that stuck with me all these years, and I often joke, and joke about it, actually. When we went to Sunday school, Johnny would come home with his pictures that he drew in Sunday school, and he was so proud of his wonderful pictures that he colored and that he drew. He loved his friend Jesus. And that teaching of love, even though later he lost his touch and connection with formal religion, never left him. And I think that's what people see in everything he did. He loved other people. And he did his best to understand and forgive. And he did his best to be the best person he could. The most startling thing I ever heard out of his mouth was, Nance, I'm not the saint that everybody thinks I am. Shh. 
I have to tell you. Wow. Wait a minute. I said, you know, I have to tell you that I said, Johnny, you're a human being. There's no space on this earth. Don't worry about it. But this is a guy who, when I was alone in Simi Valley in the middle of the night, when he was a single guy and had nothing better to do, I called one night and he picked up the phone and I was hysterical for whatever reason. I was hysterical. He got on his motorcycle in the middle of the night with no freeway through Simi Valley at the time. And he chose out and spent a couple of hours with me. I loved him dearly. I miss him very much. And I know he's there in that room with all of you probably standing behind people and laughing. You probably sensed him, some of you. Uh, but I want to say before I hang up, because it's time to make me off the phone, that I love you all for being there for Johnny, and particularly for Charlotte, and Bobby, and his nephews and nieces. And for me, because I'll see you all through it in, in the tapes later. But Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. You did great. Uh, the, some of the other nieces are here. Kathy is here, and niece Shauna is here, but they elected to have their mom, Nancy, speak, who is Johnny's older sister. So would the nieces stand up and wave, and let's all give them some love. Shauna, stand up. Okay, there's Kathy, there's Shauna. Thank you. The love of Johnny's life, here's Charlotte. <clears throat> I'm thrilled that everybody came. It's like everybody came, all my, all my friends, all of our friends, you know. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I have difficulty doing stuff like this. Although I'm, the life is a party sometimes. <laughs> but thank you. So many people flew in and drove miles and miles and miles to be here today. I'm so grateful. So thank you, guys. And I want to thank my good friend Julie and Reem for doing a wonderful job today. And Jackie, I love, I love you, Jackie. All you guys that helped me. <clears throat> it hasn't been easy thinking that this day was going to finally come. <laughs> I planned it like two months ago, and uh, here we are. Um, Johnny and I met in high school. He wanted to meet me, and he stood there like this. <laughs> and I said, who's, the, who's that guy, man? I didn't know him from Adam, you know. And I'm nine months older than he was, so I was, I came in February to Hollywood High School, and he, and he entered like r right in February also, so we were like both like two new kids on the block, except he was a junior and I was a senior. But he, he wanted to know who I was, and I didn't really know who he was, so we did, we finally met and we did hit it off and we dated for three or four months and then I went back to South Dakota and he did more movies or whatever he did and uh, 27 years later I called him <laughs> and I was living in the Bay Area and I said, remember me? He said, get down here. <laughs> So that's what happened, and uh, that was in 1990, and we were in our 40s, and I, and I, I drove down from San Francisco with my car, my dog, and myself, and a few clothes, and I made two or three trips down here, and he said, move in with me, so I did. <laughs> And five years later, we were married in 1995. So. But I dearly, I loved him so much, and he loved me so much. And uh, 
We rescued a lot of dogs is what we did. You know? We lived in the Hollywood Hills and people would drop, drop off dogs, you know. And he'd drive up the hill and he'd go, there's two more coming up the hill. <laughs> and I would go, he says, do you want me to get them? And I go, of course. So we had eight dogs at one time. But uh, we lived in the family house, which was wonderful. He hadn't cleaned it in a long time, however. <clears throat> but, and then the mansion was a big part of our life. He had been going up there for quite a long time. Hugh Hefner thought he was brilliant because he knew so much about old movies. And that's, he sat right next to Hef at the table every Monday night. And they, it was manly night there and they went, they would watch movies and Johnny knew everything about the movie and everything about the actors from the 20s and 30s. He was amazing. He came from that era, you know. I didn't, so I was like, whoa. <laughs> but I loved him and uh, I worked in assisted living for, since 2005 for a memory care facility. I did sales and marketing. I was good with people. I had a lot of, a lot of wonderful residents in, in the facility. That, and um, when Johnny started, when I really noticed that Johnny was starting to fail, um, the day I, he would, he loved to work in the yard and we had a little house in Sun Valley. And so he, he would work in the yard. And I knew that he was failing because I specialized in that disease. But he would be fine. And I would cook for him and come home and do, do my job and come home and he would be fine. Until he wasn't, until he started a fire in the garbage can. And I noticed <laughs> that was not a good thing, and so he then moved into my the facility where I worked, and uh, so I could see him every day, and he loved it there. I mean, he was used to going. I just took him to work with me. Took him to work with me every day, and um, it was just in the last at the end. Um, I had moved him from a skilled nursing facility because he had gotten pneumonia. He, He'd been in skilled nursing for a while. And um, I moved him to a six bed facility, which was like three blocks from my house so I could go and see him every day. And that was uh, a couple of few months ago. So uh, it was in February, March. So he was there in March and April, all of March and all of April when he passed away on the, on the 29th. But, um, I was able to see him and be with him, and I'm very grateful for that. So I loved him, <laughs> and thank you all for coming, you guys. Thank you. So we're here to celebrate. This concludes this part of the celebration and we want you to sign one of the index cards with your memories and those of you that can say a minute or two worth of memories on video, that would be great too. We love you all, so thank you so much for being part of the celebration of this remarkable life, Johnny Crawford. Johnny Crawford was a very talented man and just a wonderful guy all around. And I hope there's some good horses waiting for him. You know, I, I, I love John. He came to my house several times. We rode horses together. I belonged to a little roping club. He came over there, very talented man. And I loved hanging out with him, but it's not about me. It's about Johnny. We all loved him and God bless him and we're gonna all miss him. Okay, well, I've been a fan of Johnny since I was a kid, back watching him on New York television in a rifleman, and then I got to meet him at, uh, at the Autry Museum on Werner Weston's, and he gave me a demonstration with his lasso, and he was a great guy, uh, 
He was a great guy to talk to, and it was uh, nice to meet him toward, toward, the, toward the end. I never saw anyone handle a rope like him. I'm here to honor Johnny Crawford's memorialized all his life, his beautiful singing, his acting, his love of the horses, and the great outdoors. He's such a beautiful person. God bless him. Uh, Johnny Crawford, who was a master of singing the music of the 20s and 30s, of course, and of course the 50s and early 60s. So I'm anxious to see a few friends here and uh, just to have a celebration of his, of his wonderful full life. I really enjoyed all his work and uh, really going to miss him. And oh my golly, we were watching Rifleman when he was a little bitty munchkin. And he, yeah, and just in seeing him doing his roping, thank you so much for being a part of our lives. I knew John for about, oh, I'd say 10, 12 years. Um, I enjoyed his company. He's a very, very pleasant, very, very pleasant fella. Um, I'm really talented. I particularly like those uh, CDs that he turned out with his swing music. Excellent, just excellent. In fact, I, I bought several of them and gave them to friends. And I'd like to buy a couple more if they're available. They're dynamite. Uh, not much else I can say. He was a super guy. I grew up watching Johnny as a young man and got to know him, liked him, loved him like everybody else. Grew old watching him, and I'm going to miss him. The industry's going to miss him. The great guy. It was a privilege to know him. Johnny Crawford's been part of my lifelong history um, growing up. Lots of memories um, of him on television. And um, more recently, I was able to meet his wife, Charlotte, and learn that he has many, many endeavors, including being part of a band. And I'm just very happy to be able to celebrate his life. Thank you. Whenever you watch this, even if it's 10 years from now, just know that we all still love you and we st and we will miss Johnny forever and but we'll be with you and remember you too Charlotte so we love you very much and I know I speak for a lot of us so that's it yeah I'm here with my friend Tom who's a member of the real cowboy sitting next to me right here we're very honored to be here very privileged and Johnny was just just an amazing guy I played the rifleman song theme on the piano and he loved it and uh, yeah, we're just we're just really privileged to be here. Well, this is for Charlotte and, and Bob and the, the whole Crawford family. Uh, I didn't know Johnny that well, but uh, he was my hero. Uh, the reason I became an actor was his performance uh, as Mark McCain on The Rifleman. Uh, and then as an adult, I got to meet him. And uh, uh, he was even more charming and fun to be around than, than I ever imagined. Uh, uh, I feel heartbroken and I feel for all of you uh, that this wonderful person was uh, taken from us way too soon. God bless you. We did not know Johnny personally, but Sarah is a big fan of country, western, cowboy movies every day of the week. And we have made several good friends through Real Cowboys, and we feel very privileged and honored here to be here as part of this group. And we wish his uh, widow all the best, blessings on her future, and we're really grateful for the opportunity to be here. Well, I'm happy to be here on a sad occasion. We have a packed house here. It shows how much love Johnny generated in all the lives that he touched. We're just so sorry to have lost Johnny Crawford. Hey everybody, I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing me to be here at the celebration of life for Brother Johnny Crawford. I'm here representing Union Members for the Preservation of Wildlife with my national president, Randall Macero, and also Tanya Little Wolf in Wolf Mountain. She couldn't be here today, but she sends her love and her blessing. One of the favorite memories that Tanya said that she had of Johnny Crawford was wherever she saw him, he'd take his lasso and he'd go and he'd lasso her up. He'd do it, yes. And then <laughs> Tanya... 
Tanya Little Wolf being a master horse rider and lassoer herself, after he was done lassoing her, she take her lasso and then she lasso Johnny up. So I just okay. wanted to spread some love and send a smile your guys' way. Stay strong, stay focused, and God bless. This is Knight Rider and I'm out. I had the honor and pleasure of meeting Johnny Crawford too and proud to call him my friend. Uh, I'm also a bit role actor in Hollywood. My family had a top reality show, but uh, I'm an animal rights activist and that's how I happened to get to know Johnny uh, uh, for TV news coming out, covering someone else and I had the pleasure of meeting Charlotte and she introduced me to her husband. Uh, from then on, it was all history. I got him up to the high desert, got him involved at the horse rescue. He marched in the March Against Extinction on hunting and trapping and poaching taking a stand against the wild horse and burrow roundups. Uh, Johnny and, and, and Charlotte, if I have to say one thing, they believed in what I do, they believed in me, and God loved them for it because uh, I didn't have to twist their arm twice. They knew what I stood for, and uh, to us Italians, Sicilians from New York, loyalty means everything and friendship means everything. Thank you so much for letting me be part of your life. And Johnny, I love you dearly. I miss you a lot, buddy. Okay, take care. Crawford was also part of my organization, the Real Cowboys, R-E-E-L, like a movie reel. And we had the pleasure of Johnny's presence for many years. And we just love Johnny. We love you, Johnny. We really do. We're, that's why we're here. I'm sorry we have to gather under these circumstances, but uh, it's wonderful that we're all here to celebrate his life and what a life it was. He was just, uh, just a warm-hearted, wonderful person, and, uh, and I'm just happy to have uh, had him as a part of my life and to have been able to know him as long as I did. We've known Johnny and Charlotte for I can't remember how many years. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, you know, for the loss because I think it's a loss to the world and to the entertainment industry. Um, but we're here to celebrate everything he's done, celebrate his life and everything he's done for us. And it was really, it's a thrill. I never believed as a little boy, I was telling my other friend that uh, I would have grown up, you know, watching the TV shows and I could actually grow up watching, uh, you know, meeting Johnny Crawford, what a great guy he was. And we're going to miss him quite a bit. So thank you very much. Johnny used to come and stay in Chicago. He would stay with us. A lot of people don't know his grandparents are from Chicago. When he would come to Chicago, he would usually perform memorably at the Willowbrook uh, Ballroom and um, really considered himself to be an honorary uh, Chicagoan. So uh, I, I needed to be here to, uh, to represent that part of his life. And uh, we love him and, and we miss him. A lot of people have asked me my entire life, what was it like having Johnny be the son and none of you brothers. Uh, my answer to that is I was only five years old at the time. Uh, my little brother Kevin was three, Jeff was six, and my oldest brother Mike was about eight. Johnny was 11. But being 11 years old, um, you know, he was a lot older and it was never a conflict of any sort throughout all of our years. We all had different aspirations and so in essence, uh, it was never a conflict um, in, in any capacity whatsoever. We all went our own ways later on. Uh, we got together with, as musicians with Johnny, it was great. Johnny was a very peaceful, calm, humble guy for, for his entire life. He, he never ever bragged about himself. He was kind. I will remember Johnny Crawford for his bright smile. All these guys took my words away, but he was humble with a bright smile, and he had a sweet personality and disposition that no one could match. And I believe from the bottom of my heart, he will go down and is the greatest childhood actor of all time. Okay, okay Slady. Slady. Probably one of the most gentle, peaceful souls I've ever met, actors, you know, and uh, we had a lot of fun together. You know, we, we, did, we visited the wolf retreat. He was big into um, those type of things, you know, saving animals and stuff, the horses and all. And I uh, just really, really enjoyed his, uh, we went together about maybe four or five different events together. And I met his wife, Charlotte, and she was such a sweetheart. Just a nice group of people. So I just want to, my heart goes out to him. I know he's up in the uh, sanctuary in the sky. <laughs> And uh, I really want to say he's one of the nicest people I've ever met. So, Johnny, Charlotte, um, we'll catch up with you next time.
Have a nice day. I just want to say thank you again to Johnny for the gig that the Musicians Union brought him with the Django Reinhardt kind of Parisian jazz from the 20s um, up to my park and my neighborhood, which was Rustic Canyon, the old uplifters with Will Rogers and the polo and everything. Um, and it was a real treat. On Monday nights, the neighborhood got together and they just loved having Johnny Crawford, the cowboy, <laughs> come all the way up there with Parisian hot jazz, kind of a nice mix. Um, I'll miss you, Johnny. I'm glad you're a real cowboy and all the honors and, and um, it was great, great knowing you. Thank you. Johnny Spirit is right here with us now. Johnny was such a humble and such a loving person. And I did a lot of things with him through Randy Macero, through the Preservation of Wildlife. And um, Johnny loved animals. He loved animals. He loved people. God bless. Johnny Crawford. I want to keep the website going as long as the family is willing to do that. And um, we're going to continue to sell uh, his CDs and DVDs. The Rifleman has never not been on TV since it premiered. So I, I think Johnny's legacy will continue. And it has a lot of fans that will, uh, like me, who will uh, help, that, help that along, I hope. I've known Charlotte for over 10 years now. She is a wonderful, wonderful, caring, sensitive, loving lady. Um, I had a chance also to meet Johnny. We all got together, we had hugs all the time, and it was just an amazing experience. I couldn't be more glad to be here and be part of it. When I woke up this morning and thought, oh my God, what, did I, what have I done? <laughs> but you know, it was wonderful and everything that, everything went so smoothly and the wonderful, the wonderful stories of Johnny and, and the fact that I was with him that long is pretty amazing. <laughs> so I love you guys for helping and doing everything. Anyway, I hope, I hope everybody had fun and enjoyed this because everybody put a lot of effort into it. And I was, I'm so grateful. And I was so glad that we have it at the William S. Hart Museum and Park because Johnny loved it here. And we came out here several times together and went on tours of the mansion and the museum. And William S. Hart was one of his very favorite people. And that's one of the reasons I chose to have it here. So, so thank you for everything. And I love everybody. <laughs>